We are very grateful to have you here. And uh, without further ado, please note the recording will start now. And I will begin. Sebastian, it's up to you now. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. And uh, good morning to those in North and South America. Uh, good afternoon to those uh, who, like me, are from Europe uh, or from Africa, or those tuning in from uh, the Middle East. And of course, a good evening to those uh, tuning in and uh, being with us from the Asia Pacific region. Uh, my name is Sebastian Bruns, uh, and I head the Center for Maritime Strategy and Security at the Institute for Security Policy at the University of Kiel in Northern Germany. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this virtual event spanning more than half the globe. I'm delighted to introduce today's keynote speakers. First off, a warm welcome to Dr. Eric Thompson, who is the Vice President and Director, Strategy, Policy, Plans and Programs Division at the Center for Naval Analysis in Arlington, Virginia. He will provide opening remarks shortly. After that, it is my pleasure as one of the two editors of the Fest Shift to share some thoughts on the policy and political science related chapters of the book. You will then hear from Dr. Randy Papadopoulos, historian of the Department of the Navy, Washington, DC, my fellow partner in crime for this book. I'm also delighted to introduce to you another friend, Dr. Tom Darrell Young. Tom joins us from the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California, sure lovely place, where he's a senior lecturer and program manager of the Europe Center for Civil Military Relations. He will share his perspective on conceptualizing naval and maritime strategy at, right after Randy. This should take about 30 minutes and we will then turn to the moderated discussion. Please be advised that this whole event is recorded and will be posted on ISPK's website later on. To ask a question or post a comment, simply use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Please be so kind to introduce yourself briefly and state whom your question is directed to. All of the individuals that I just mentioned will be participating in the Q&A and we will be joined by today's guest of honor the man that needs no introduction, Captain Peter Swartz, United States retired. If you need an introduction, there, there happens to be a book out on him. So uh, you, can, you can read up on that. Uh, and 20 minutes before we close, uh, Peter will also provide some closing remarks for today. Now over to you, Eric. Thank you very much. Thank you, Randy. Uh, it really is a pleasure to be here today uh, as part of this great celebration um, of the, both the completion of this book and the purpose that we set up on this journey together. Uh, and my special thanks to Sebastian and Randy for all the hard work they did in arranging this discussion, which I think is, is, is a nice culmination of that effort. So for those of you who don't know me, um, I came to the Center for Naval Analysis about just over 20 years ago. Um, and when I walked in the door, um, between when I had interviewed at CNA and when I walked in the door, Peter Schwartz had taken over the team that I would eventually lead, uh, that he would eventually lead again um, and uh, allowed me to uh, be a partner with him for, for over two decades. And so to start this conversation, I thought I would go ahead and give you a quick overview of how I saw Peter operate, what I saw him doing, probably what I learned and many of you learned from him, and, and what the results were for those kinds of actions and activities and behaviors and efforts uh, and the output that he was able to produce over those couple of decades. Um, when, I, when I came to CNA, I learned immediately that Peter had joined the Center for Naval Analysis in order to continue his service, his service to the nation, his, his service to the allies and partners, and his service to the broader undertaking of understanding, expanding the power of knowledge and insight and research and thinking and strategizing about what the maritime can and should mean to national security and international security. And when I came to work for him, um, he gave me lots and lots of opportunities to grow and explore. He provided a great deal of mentorship and he gave me a very, very long leash. Uh, and while I was working with him and for him, I spent as much time at the very end of that leash as possible. And when I, when I look back, what I saw what Peter was doing, there were several notable aspects to it. First of all, I saw in Peter that he was always interested in being a contributor and was never concerned with being the star. There are innumerable books and studies and articles that are out there that are a result largely of Peter's research, his coaching, his contributions, his writings. Many of you have probably incorporated his work and his perspectives and the research and, and, and information he discovered and uncovered and shared 
Uh, I can think of many books, the most recent probably, Ocean's Ventured, uh, would not have been possible without not only the work he did, but the thinking he did and his selfless commitment to put that story together and pull the data and research together to make it one of the more powerful books we've seen this year until this one was released. Um, and then, but there are innumerable other studies and articles and book chapters that are a direct reflection of the work he did, the thinking he did, and the mentorship he did. He often gets credit, sometimes he didn't, but he never sought it for himself and never put himself in front of that. Second, I saw Peter be consistently present. He was present in meetings, he was present in discussions, he was present in conferences, he was present, present where people needed him. He spent uncountable hours in the Pentagon over the last 20 years being around people, being in conversations that mattered, being ready to contribute where and when he could so that he would not fail to take advantage of any opening to help other people understand and appreciate the value of maritime power, the challenges of figuring out how to use it, and connecting people that could benefit from that understanding. A third thing that I saw Peter do was he spent a lot of time with junior people. He would seek out bright young minds. He would encourage them. He would find ways to connect them to the broader community and to the broader issues at play. There are innumerable speech writers for CNOs and Lieutenant JGs who were stuck into OPNAB or fleet headquarter staffs or NOOZ special assistants to the CNO that came to rely on Peter for, for, their, for their professional development and, and helping them understand the world around there. Peter, the fourth thing I recognize is Peter was organically and inherently an internationalist. He was constantly reaching out across borders, across um, oceans, um, across generations in order to find and connect people so that collectively we could think about and understand the power of, of, of thoughtful, strategic thinking and orientation and cooperation and collaboration. Fifth, I saw that Peter reached out not only to the next generation of officers, but the next generation of scholars. Um, and he believed that their work could make a difference. He believed that if he helped them find new sources and new methods and new approaches and new authors that they could draw from, their work would be more impactful, would be more powerful, and that he could set them on a course where they could reach beyond their potential that they would find if they sat alone in a library carol trying to figure this out for themselves. And he, he spent a lot of time making sure that other people knew these scholars were, were up and coming, were doing interesting work. Um, several of them are on screen today. Uh, at least at least one or two of them uh, have already spoken so far in this conversation. So that's powerful. I also saw him build networks and connections that be became mechanisms by which people could collaborate, people could debate, people could see and understand the full picture of who was out there, whether that was the strategy discussion group, prolific email distribution list, probably all of us have seen those uh, over the years. Um, his willingness to try to get the right people invited to an event or a conversation, reaching out to folks who could contribute to uh, publications or calls for papers or, or calls for book chapters. Uh, he did that time and time again. Another thing I saw in Peter was he never failed to recognize and communicate missed opportunities and things that just didn't come together, conversations that didn't happen, uh, people that weren't invited to a meeting, and he didn't, he never pointed the blame at anyone else, but he always stopped to talk about what did that opportunity look like? What might we have been able to do? What should we do next time? And passing on that sense of missed opportunities or valuable learning environments, and even if it doesn't come out the way you liked, understanding why that would be and preparing for the next decision that you would have to make as part of this community was something he continually did. On the upside, he never failed to, to, to celebrate success. Um, he would look at things and say, wow, this is remarkable. We've made progress. People are thinking differently. They're including different voices. This is building on 30 years of, of, of history and progress and a 10 year absence. And we picked up and started making progress again. And so he helped understand, he helped people like me and probably many of you understand what success and impact and value looked like in the space of history and political science and maritime and strategy uh, level activities, whether they were applied or whether they were conceptual. The, the last thing I would say is he did all of this with a, with a sense of alacrity. He was consistently upbeat. He was uh, always uh, buffing up other people, encouraging other people. He combined that with an unstoppable work ethic. I mean, the times he spent 
weekends and nights and vacations and airplane time trying to do work that would help other people or trying to help other people do their own work um, was, in, was remarkable. And in fact, it was infectious. And I would say it was, it was contagious. And that kind of inspiration that came out of a career, no, notably his second career, of, of working and operating like this for over two decades, I think is largely the kind of actions and behaviors that inspired the editors to envision this work that we're talking about to celebrate Peter's impact on the naval strategy community. It, it, it inspired the authors to want to take their time and contribute something important and valuable to the broader public dis discussion. And I would suspect that it encouraged all of us who are here today in this call to join together to reflect and celebrate that and challenge ourselves to make sure that we understand and appreciate and take those lessons forward with us as we go on on this venture ourselves together, um, standing on Peter's shoulders. Uh, and so I think that is what I look at and I see over the last 20 years. And I just wanted to share that perspective with you uh, and, and thank Peter uh, for all of that consistently over the years. Uh, and thank you all for being here to be part of that, to reflect on that and to show him that we all deeply appreciate those things that he's been doing. So with that, I'll bring my remarks to a close. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric, for your remarks. Groucho Marx once observed that, and I, and I quote, politics is the art of looking for trouble, finding it everywhere, diagnosing it incorrectly, and applying the wrong remedies, end quote. That is the playing field that political scientists like myself, even the most idealist ones, but especially those who seek to provide policy relevant research and teaching have to deal with. The realist, that much still holds true, is an idealist mocked by reality. Political scientists who work on and with navies can sometimes encounter a challenging environment. For instance, some in uniform fall prey to the misunderstanding that a political scientist is automatically a politician. Nothing could be further from the truth. Likewise, academics who find themselves working with navies and militaries will often have to learn the lingo of sea power and naval strategy, and they have to find their ways through the defense policy maze. They will have to ride out, sometimes quite literally, when they are uh, embarked on a warship, that desk-bound theory, theories and methodology can only go so far. At the same time, they will also find that the sea and the study of sea power has something uniquely enriching and satisfying to it. Understanding naval dynamics in one place of the world will enable the understanding and application of sea power in a different part of the, of the world. Naval strategy and maritime security are areas which continue to be of relatively high significance, yet relatively under-researched. And if Alfred Thermahan or Julian Corbett are not enough, policy analysts should look at the somewhat legendary political scientist Samuel Huntington for inspiration. Long before he wrote about the clash of civilizations, he penned an essay printed in Proceedings in 1954 on the need for naval strategy. This shows that you can be a navalist first and then become famous. It doesn't necessarily have to be the other way around. Conceptualizing naval and maritime and naval strategy, the book contains eight chapters that can roughly be categorized under the political science policy umbrella. I would like to spend, spend the remainder of my time and my remarks to offer some very brief thoughts on the value proposition of these essays. First, Jim Bergeron's essay, Deterrence and its Maritime Dimension, provides a fresh perspective on deterrence and the roles and missions of naval forces in the strategic competition that's emerging in these 2020s. I firmly believe that we must spend more time and effort to make sure that conventional, conventional and nuclear deterrence is understood and practiced better. As a German and contrary to Dr. Strangelove, I can say that we have unlearned to love the bomb. Second, Martin Murphy wrote a chapter about elevating difference, regaining the Navy's strategic influence in a joint world. This essay is a stark reminder that there are particulars to how navies think, operate and modernize. The strategic culture of a Navy offers opportunities for policymakers, but it also requires a sense of self on behalf of naval planners and analysts alike, so they can better articulate what navies are all about, especially in environments where jointness and multi-domain are on top of everybody's bingo card. Two chapters in the book deal with writing actual naval strategy. Andrzej Makowski uh, from Poland 
describes that country's strategic concept for maritime security and how it was developed, issued, and implemented. It is a prime case study for how landlocked countries can go about, or semi-landlocked semi countries, uh, continental countries, can go about formulating capstone documents for their navies. However, a naval strategy process, not necessarily products, is important. My own chapter on writing a German naval strategy, one which was never officially published, but the contents of which found its way into German Navy thinking and strategic planning, could remind readers of the shoals and shallow banks of putting sea power theory into practice. Also, I hope that the, that the, that the essay that I wrote can help understand how Germany thinks about utilizing its Navy. One document that was used here for that German document for that German capstone strategy, and then one that I would recommend to anyone planning to write or to analyze naval strategy is Peter Swartz, US Navy capstone strategy, what to consider before you write one from 2009. We used an adapted version of it for the German Navy. Three more chapters in the book cover regions of particular interest and maritime security challenges. Eric Thompson and Zara Vogler offer considerations for US naval strategy in the Eastern Mediterranean through the prisms of regional conflict, hydrocarbon resource competition, and great power conflict. If only there was an official history available for the United States Sixth Fleet and its best practices of Cold War and post-Cold War days, much like we have them available for the US Fifth and Seventh Fleet. It is hard to understate the political tension at sea and in the Eastern Mediterranean region at large, in particular for NATO allies, for Israel and for the United States and for the transatlantic community. Nilanti Samaranayaka describes for us India's naval and maritime power. And without stating the obvious that India is a force to reckon with, I would also like to underscore how important her perspectives on naval modernization and the defense industrial base were to me. It also highlighted how multifaceted maritime threats to an emerging great power such as India can be, echoes of which will sound familiar to American and European naval experts. Jeremy Stöss, an Austro-American no less, writes about changing threat perceptions on the Northern European flank. Bastion, backwater, battlefront, the Norwegian Sea, the Geo Gap, the High North, the Baltic, these oceans and seas certainly sound very familiar to those who remember, wrote and or operationalized the maritime strategy of the 1980s. Per Mark Twain, quote, history does not re repeat itself, it rhymes. Unquote. We need to have that conversation that spans a generation or two of naval strategists without superimposing the one size fits all approach. This leads me to the final chapter of the book that I would like to mention. Larissa Forster from Switzerland, another landlocked country, writes about the soft power currencies of US Navy hospital, deploy hospital ship deployments. No thanks to COVID 19, hospital ships have recently been in the spotlight again. The article to me is very important in that it reminds us of the maritime security missions of navies uh, that are often derided as low end. Going forward, I submit to you that the Cold War at sea was a der der derivation of the norm and that it very much focused on high end warfare. Likewise, the post Cold War era of navies was an exception to the rule too, because it focused on low end missions in the absence of a sea control challenger. The 2020s and the future, ladies and gentlemen, might be a new norm where high-end capabilities and low-end missions and everything in between will have to be considered. Thank you for your attention. Over to the Californian coast, Tom. Actually, it's over to me, Sebastian. That is right, that is right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, just trying to watch the schedule. Um, good morning, I'm Randy Papadopoulos. Um, I should note that uh, uh, up front that uh, even though I am an employee of the Department of the Navy, I am the, my remarks today are those strictly of my own and not representative of the United States government, Department of Defense, or the Department of the Navy. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. David Winkler for promoting this event through the Naval Historical Foundation, as well as to the contributors of the volume. I believe nine of them are on the call right now with us, as, and uh, I think that they all deserve a round of applause which you'll notice we have buttons we can do that with, so I'll take the advantage of doing that right now. Uh, I'd like to recognize uh, some longtime friends as well, Admiral Jerry Holland, uh, as well as several other flag officers who have registered and, si and joined us this morning. I can't recognize all of them right now. And finally, my gratitude to ISPK 
Europe's foremost nexus of naval strategic thought for its sublime encouragement and arrangements and support for this event. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about maritime strategy in history, slightly different title from Sebastian's, but uh, uh, very much related. I'm going to talk about the seven essays that are historically based, not including my own, in this volume. I'm, I'm going to open up by saying basically that as a historian, we all try to perpetually make my, our work re relevant to the reading public. In that regard, I'm going to paraphrase David Hackett Fisher of Brandeis University, who observed that military historians enjoy a real opportunity which other historians don't. Our efforts can address and inform the work of current day military practitioners. Given today's book is about maritime and naval strategy, I would be especially pleased if naval practitioners would look to its chapters for help in thinking in maritime terms about how to link means to ends and as a guide for how to complete that most complex of challenges. This is about a very complex set of organizations, navies, and the, the maritime domain, and that's something that's not very familiar to most people. Now, I called it complex because the intersection of policy and strategy is a big problem, one which can affect national destiny. Trying to understand decisions made at that level is volatile, for these are inherently political choices. Documenting such solutions often challenges historians like myself, because we're usually outsiders to the decision-making process. For anyone to try to reconstruct choices, documents are often not retained in archives or at least are not well organized. However, this book, we hope, offers useful examples of how strategic choices were made, how priorities were set, and how resources were all allotted. In some cases shown here, the decisions proved wrong, the priorities incorrect, the resources misspent. Studying those errors in context can help lead to better decisions in the future. Now, in conceptualizing maritime and naval strategy, we present 16 chapters split evenly between history and political science, plus a generous forward from John Hattendorf and, of course, Peter Swartz's voluminous bibliography. Picking from seven historically focused essays to highlight my points, I'd like to all offer some additional propositions for readers and users of it. Jeffrey Till makes the point that comparisons can help shed light upon crafting strategic answers. Comparing a service to another can do this. His essay draws upon the experience of both the Royal Canadian Navy and the United States Army, an interesting pair, to explain how the US Navy developed its strategic thinking after the Cold War. Steve Wills cites the in internal dynamics of the Pentagon's Navy staff during the 1980s to illustrate its lack of ease with the maritime strategy and in all of its aspects, and the desire to keep the maritime strategy's momentum going was hindered by that lack of ease. For anyone who argues, as I have heard, that budgets are more important than planning, they need to know how their 1980s predecessors balanced these books. Similarly, Peter Haynes highlights how personality made a difference, with the sometimes polarizing Chief of Naval Operations, Elmo Zumwalt, setting the stage for a strategic renaissance. If today's US Navy strategists think they face an uphill struggle to match resources to commitments, Bud Zumwalt's story shows how his Navy sur surmounted a figurative Mount Everest to face a great power competition of his time. For Seth Cropsey, success had limits because sticking to a maritime solution as both medieval Venice and early modern England did takes resolve. He highlights that countries must always strictly pick any fights ashore, for if a strategy of sea power is nationally mortgaged, it is impossible to reconstitute. Michael Haas argues strategists must get the opponent right, showing how the US Navy, I would add NATO as well, misread the Soviet submarine threat before 1970. Luckily, an outsider, the Central Intelligence Agency and CNA, found the real answer and kicked hard enough to convince senior leaders to change. Narushige Michishita shows how Japan stepped up to help its Cold War American ally, despite domestic political pressure not to do so. Current American Navy planners should read his essay to understand that allies reward trust placed in them by coming through and enabling work and operations when needed. Finally, Amund Lundesgaard argues a sea services thought can be forced to adapt, as the US Navy proved after 9-11. The direction taken may not have been where the U.S. Navy wanted to go beforehand, 
But in a democratic republic, a good strategic argument needs to be made to convince political leaders otherwise. Ultimately, all of these authors were outsiders, but they gained insider knowledge by relying on our friend Peter Swartz. Their writing represents the acme of good history, transporting one's mind back to a specific milieu, just as musical moments of our lives shift our moods back to a specific time and place. To understand more of what navies are and how they, how, they, how they solve strategic problems, we need more cooperation and support of the type Peter has given us. This would be the best thanks we could pay him for all the support he's given us. If I can make a parochial plea, it would be for more naval practitioners to think a bit more like Peter did by saving, then sharing what they have learned. Finally, it is my hope that we have given all of you a base from which to start on this next leg of this voyage. Thank you very much. Um, I want to say thank you to everybody who's dialed in and for attending this very interesting and unique form of a book launch. And uh, Peter, congratulations on a life of work very well done. Uh, Rudiger Safransky recently um, published a book uh, with the intriguing title of it. It's a biography of Goethe. The title is Life as a Work of Art. If I were your biographer, Peter, I think the title I would choose for you is Life as Hard Work Well Done. So bravo zoo to you as well, to, as well as to Sebastian and Randy for all the work that went into this wonderful book. I have to say on reflection is that if I can quote the Brits, you know you're getting on when one becomes involved with Feschwiften dedicated to the works of colleagues and contemporaries. And this is just one of a number that I'm involved with and I'm happy to be part of this discussion today. I think we all have stories about how we met and how we've interacted with Peter over the years. Uh, very briefly, or maybe I will share with you mine. Uh, perhaps my experience is a bit odd, or maybe it's, it's more within the norm. Um, I was preparing to return to the University of Geneva in 1988 to defend my PhD dissertation from Washington. And returning to my apartment one evening in November of that year, I found a letter addressed to me from the US mission to NATO. I was perplexed and confused, but I opened it and in it, there was a letter signed by a Captain Peter Schwartz who asked for any of the publications that I had produced over the last few years that had dealt with the Radford Collins Naval, Command, uh, Naval Control and Protection and Shipping Agreement in the Pacific with the British Commonwealth. Why? Because of course, in his part-time uh, work uh, at, the Naval, at the US mission, he was putting together a bibliography on the maritime strategy. Well, it wasn't a direct order, but I took it as such, and I was happy to share those publications with them. 18 months later, I got to meet the man in Brussels as I was then at the Strategic Studies Institute and I had been charged with the European account. Heady days indeed back in, those, in the late 1980s and early 90s. And we never lost touch. And I was always ready to support him as he had generously helped me over time. No matter what the subject of his inquiry, you always knew that you were not wasting time no matter how obscure the question. And it was likely to have an important effect more often than not. I rather suspect that everyone here at the launch has a similar story of the man. But let me refer to the book. I find it rather unprecedented. We have a retired US Naval captain over 20 years as an analyst at a federally funded research and development corporation being honored for what he truly is, a practitioner and a scholar. Has anyone else ever had such an honor? Given the fact that John Hattendorf is now retired, I suspect he has time to investigate and report back to us. I'm going to bet that no, this is the first. And Sebastian, as a consolation for your inability to get the timing just perfect for the maritime strategy, German maritime strategy document, if, if you take my bet, if I'm wrong, I'm happy to buy you dinner and a delightful bottle of wine at that Bremen Ratzkeller, the, the, the very location where that opportunity unfortunately was missed for you. The work itself is a wonderful testament both to Peter and the compliments are due to the authors of this fine edition of incisive writings, as well as to the editors for putting it all together. 18 chapters in all. My task is to comment briefly on common themes of all the works. Because of time constraints, I'm going to limit myself to just one. And I feel the most important, and I think Randy would agree with this. That is to say the search for that elusive balance in that nexus of policy and strategy that can produce defense planning coherence. When they work, capability and fleet, fleet design are in agreement and they are coherent. 
Case in point, let's look at the OPNAVs or the U.S. Navy staff's organization and planning challenges over the year that is touched on in a, in a number of the chapters in this book. In effect, Peter's work over the years provides us not only with the history of how the OPNAV works, but also its organizational sociology in explaining how it has struggled to develop coherent budgets and strategy over time. This is picked up very nicely by Steve Wills as he documents the battle between the use, what I like to say, the users of Excel, that is to say, those doing quantitative analysis and the users of Word, those who are writing strategy. You know, Peter's admission is that you're right. Peter's admission is right in that you need both. For as Seth Cropsey's prescient point, that deriving strategy from abstract analyses of capabilities and assumptions of human rationality provides an inaccurate model of both politics and conflicts. This is as apropos to the OPNAB today as it was in his superb treatment of the analysis, uh, treatment and analysis of Venice and the Royal Navy after the Second World War. I hope, however, that Pete Haynes is wrong in his writing in his solid chapter that the OPNAV is too big to coordinate its community's programmatic decisions and develop a strategy-based conceptual framework about how the pieces of the fleet should fit together. If Pete is right, how can one hope for the development of a coherent strategy, let alone one supported by the Navy budget or the PAW, and not the other way around? Hass's chap chapter, where he cites Peter's understanding and adversary strategic calculus as a means to ensure that you don't get it wrong, is spot on, as he argues, in my view. Once they take hold, the path dependencies resulting from defective analysis can become inordinately difficult to unravel. In fact, some never are. Amen. Go to the Pentagon and look around. As a result of this reality, many members of Congress have been quite vocal about this very point as seen in their criticism of the Navy shipbuilding program of late, programs, plural, of late. Alas, the U.S. Navy is not alone in this regard. As Sebastian clearly argues, Germany has faced and continues to face similar challenges to produce coherent naval strategy. Pity the German strategists. They face challenges unknown in the Anglo-Saxon and Francophone world. Why do I say this? As Sebastian argues, you cannot use the word strategy in the political debate. It's, it's not accepted. It's just like you, you cannot use general staff as a noun. You can only use it as an adjective. So what I'm saying is that, and what our, uh, Sebastian argues very clearly that you know, the defense debate in Germany continues to be hampered by long lasting historical legacies. And thus one still needs to speak in code words. As the German maritime strategy effort demonstrated, the German political class is not ready for this yet. As Sebastian, as Sebastian so correctly writes, Germany can produce Alexander Humboldt and a Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, but no naval strategist. How true. In this vein, you could argue that Tirpitz had a clearer vision of creating a battle fleet than a coherent naval strategy on how to use it successfully. A similar challenge is found in Poland, as so well argued by Professor Makowski. But here the impediments are much different. Let me explain some of the nuances in the creation of the Polish maritime concept paper. It's called a concept because it can't be called a strategy. If it were a strategy, this would imply that it is official policy and it would have to be funded. Therefore, it had to be drafted under the auspices of the National Security Bureau, which falls under the president in that semi-presidential system, and not under the sponsorship of the Ministry of Defense. Thus, it can only hope ever to be a concept. As such, we are all waiting for Warsaw to fund the Polish Navy, and I predict we will continue to wait. All the while, the Polish Navy continues to deteriorate. I would advise both my German and Polish friends to misquote John Paul Jones, do not give up the necessary naval thinking needed to bridge the policy strategy coherence divide. To end my concept, no, to end my comment, sorry, this very issue of bridging the coherence gap is a task Peter has taken on and has pressed for solutions for decades. And for this, we are all in his debt for moving the debate along and keeping everybody honest in the meanwhile. If strategists in future will be able to see better the challenges and nuances of naval strategy coherence, it will, become, it will be because they, like the rest of us, will be standing on the shoulders of Peter. Indeed, this must be seen as Peter's most important legacy as being a selfless mentor to so many. For what greater evidence is needed of his lasting effect than he has, that he has inspired two generations of United States scholars and analysts, 
plus a few Germans and Canadians along the way. But I have to say, this is relatively easy. We also have to acknowledge that he has mentored those from landlocked Austria and Switzerland by encouraging them to become naval analysts. A unique accomplishment, unlikely to be surpassed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. And over to Sebastian, please. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we have about 30 minutes now for uh, questions, uh, comments, um, and, and the likes. And uh, if you have comments, if you have a commentary uh, question, please remember uh, to put it into the, uh, the chat function. Um, perhaps briefly introduce yourself if you could um, and uh, who your question or comment is directed at. And of course, this goes to all speakers, including um, Peter. Um, so this is your chance. Or you can just read the book, but that of course takes a little bit more time and effort. So maybe since there's a couple of people in the in the in the chat that have indicated that they want to hear Peter speak, um, then let's move on to that, and then we can we can have some Q and A uh, uh, afterwards. Jeff Klein has the first question towards directed to Peter in the first place. So why don't we go ahead and ask questions and, and, and Q&A uh, first, and then uh, Peter, it's all yours. Uh, I do have some remarks. Uh, you will believe it impossible, all of you that know me, uh, that they're short, uh, but I timed it and it's less than 10 minutes. I dare say that none of you have ever had a conversation with me under 10 minutes, um, but, uh, but I'm gonna try on this time. First of all, uh, lots of thank yous. Uh, thanks especially to Sebastian and Randy uh, for having conceptualized and organized the Fesh Rift, uh, including publication of the book and this event. I was uh, actually speechless, uh, true fact, unbelievable as it may be to many of you, uh, when Randy announced it at my retirement ceremony at, uh, at CNA. Uh, I'm, I'm still deeply honored. And thanks to Eric and Tom's thoughtful comments as well. Uh, uh, you made me blush, uh, but, but thank you very much for the, uh, for the tribute. And thanks especially to the 16 authors of the book's chapters, 18 if you count Randy and Sebastian, many of whom are online with us today. Their products are actually what this is all about. And thanks to all of you, others uh, who are participating in this event. I've seen the list. You're all busy people with important things to do. I'm honored you would spend some time with us today. I hope you'll be able to obtain the book somehow and will find its comments useful as I already have. Thanks especially also, you know me well enough to know that I couldn't let this chance go by to my wife Twee, our daughter Diana and her family in London and our son Daniel uh, in whose condo I'm now sitting and who's standing by to help me deal with any glitches on Zoom. Uh, I'm most, I've, I've got a great family and I'm most appreciative for their support, uh, including the support I'm getting right now as we speak uh, to make sure that uh, I don't hit the wrong button. Uh, I thought a lot about this uh, during this week about how the Peter Swartz that you're honoring today came about. And I realized that there were at least two major influences that I thought I'd share with you. Uh, the first was my university experience. You know, back in the 60s and 70s and 80s, I had the good fortune to have attended three Cracker Jack institutions, Brown, Johns Hopkins, SAIS, and Columbia. I was an international relations and security studies major. I was taught by top-notch professors, Lee Williams at Brown, Bob Osgood at SAIS, uh, Bob Jervis at Columbia, among many others. Uh, and uh, what I was taught about international relations and security studies, with strategic nuclear policy and the folder gap. Course after course on strategic nuclear strategy and the balance of power on the ground in Germany. I was a Navy ROTC midshipman and later a US Navy officer. And I could have sworn that there was more to security studies than that. But that was what security studies were all about. I asked for things to read about naval strategy and policy and how they might relate to nukes and the folder gap. But there wasn't much in what I was given that related to what real live Navy strategists were wrestling with 
at that time in the Pentagon and on fleet staffs. There wasn't much of a literature, I was told. So I resolved to do something about that. I, I it, it just got in my bloodstream. It wasn't something that I, you know, there was this eureka moment that I said, I will take care of that. Uh, but I, it was something that I, uh, I thought needed doing. I couldn't write it all. I couldn't even write a significant part of it. But I began to prod others and began to keep a sharp eye out for authors I could help in their work, uh, as, as uh, Eric so eloquently described, uh, to create that literature that I thought was so sorely needed. Um, I'm sitting one day in a um, Naval History Conference at Annapolis, and this guy gets up on the stage, this is in the 80s, um, uh, older man, and uh, uh, he's this retired businessman, and he's talking about something called War Plan Orange. Uh, he's writing a book about it, it turns out. And I'm listening to him, and I'm hearing what I do, and I'm hearing who I work with, except they've got different proper names, uh, but the, the, the ranks are the same. Uh, the problems of many of them are the same. And so afterwards, I go up to Ed Miller, because that's who it was, and said, who are you? And why are you doing what you're doing? And this is terrific. And how can I help? How can we as a Navy help? Because you have really as, as a, 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 a writing something that we don't have in the Navy, which is a history of how strategy got made in a critical era. And um, that's kind of how it started in the 80s. Uh, second major influence was Dave Rosenberg. You all know Dave, of course. Actually, I had probably met many of you initially through Dave. In those days, he was ubiquitous in a very positive way. Uh, Dave, in the early 80s, was writing his famous article on the origins of overkill, nuclear weapons and American strategy. And he asked me to take a look at a draft, which I did. And I made a few suggestions. Next thing I know, the article is in the prestigious journal International Security on page one. And there on page one, footnote one, Dave said something to the effect that the author thanks Admiral Arleigh Burke, General Andrew Goodpaster, and Commander Peter Swartz for their insight and assistance. Whoa! Suddenly I'm publicly announced as traveling in very rarefied company. And I started getting calls. All I've done was comment on a draft. And now I'm famous. And David done all the work. This looked like a very promising line of work for me, I figured. And um, so I continued. 35 years or so later, when Sebastian and Randy asked me to contribute something biographical for this Feshrif, I went back and rummaged around in all my files. Turns out I've been thanked by friends, colleagues, mentees, and shipmates in the acknowledgement section of almost 100 articles, book chapters, and books. It's an endeavor, as Eric pointed out, uh, more effusively than I would, um, it's an endeavor I took very seriously and still do. I helped as a so-called fourth reader on many PhD dissertations, and then I helped reshape them into books, trying to encourage writers on naval policy and strategy and trying to build a literature. I've had some successes in my life, family, professions, good health so far, lots of travel, but my success in helping to stimulate a naval literature ranks right up there with them. I'd like to close, therefore, my prepared remarks by charging all of you to do what you can to continue and improve on this work. Read, write, help, make connections, publish, mentor, distribute, put the right things in the right hands of the right people. Some exciting things are already in the mill. For example, Steve Wills has a book coming out next year on the effect of Goldwater Nichols on the Navy. Uh, Narashiga Michishida, Michi, is finishing an in-depth book on the relationship between the U.S. Navy, the maritime strategy, and the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force in the 1980s. My colleague, friend, successor, and boss, Nalanti Samaranayake, continues to churn out timely reports and papers on the Indian Navy and the other Indian Ocean naval policy and strategy topics. All of their chapters in the Feshrift give you a foretaste of what to expect and what's coming. So again, thank you all for sitting in on this session. 
thanks to my family and all the authors in the Feshrit book. Thanks to Sebastian and Randy for dreaming this up and seeing it through. Thanks to Tom Young for agreeing to critique what came out of all of this. And thanks to the United States of America, to the US Navy and to CNA for providing me with an environment within which I could thrive and serve the interests and values of our nation and its allies and partners. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Peter. We wanted to give you the last word at, that sta at this stage because well, the book is about you and in your honor, but it's also fitting because you really do give us suitable marching orders to go forward. And really, really, I think that you have encapsulated a lot of what you've done for us. I have to add that there is one point that we put in the conclusion of the book that you alluded to in your remarks, which is that every time we talked to you and asked you for help, you'd be talking to us on the phone and all of a sudden this email message would pop in, but there wouldn't just be one email message with a PDF attachment, there'd be about 12. And on my Navy computer of the 2000s and 2010s, uh, all of a sudden I'd have to start moving things into my saved files folders because I didn't have enough room because you would inundate an inbox. And it really is true that you've provided so much to us and I'm glad that we have this opportunity to, uh, to, to recognize that contribution and to thank you for it. We have two questions so far in the queue. I'm going to be chairing the Q&A. The first is from Jeff Klein. Um, I wanted to give him the opportunity to, to ask it if he feels like it or if he wants me to, uh, to praise it for him. I want to make sure that Jeff explains who he is as well uh, because uh, it's appropriate for everybody to know. Um, and uh, Jeff's question basically said, what would be the most impactful contribution Peter made in his own mind? But uh, Jeff, if you want to embellish that, please feel free to unmute yourself and do so. Well, I have unmuted myself, and thanks, Randy, for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I think uh, uh, the comments about the Excel spreadsheet uh, uh, counter strategist, that's me at the Naval Postgraduate School and the Operations Research Department. And, but I've known Peter for a long time and, and, and uh, appreciate uh, the contributions he made and so what I, throughout his entire career. So I was just curious in his, in his own mind, what does he believe his contribution throughout his career was most impactful uh, for either uh, maritime strategy or the US Navy. With that, I'll turn it back to him. Thank you. Hey, um, I, I, I think as I, as I said, I think it's the, the, the help that I've been give, able to, to give um, to creating and maintaining and sustaining and moving forward this literature on Navy strategy and policy uh, to include uh, Excel cell sheet policies. Um, the, uh, the, the cupboard was almost bare. Uh, old Mahan, uh, of course, uh, Corbett, a few in America knew who he was at the time. John Hattendorf had, had yet to have done some of his uh, brilliant work. Uh, there was a guy who wrote a book, a naval officer, J.C. Wiley, unknown in academia when I was going through. When I discovered that a naval officer had written a th exceedingly thoughtful book on, uh, on strategy, and it was called on strategy, uh, I was astounded. I got together with John Hattendorf, and John brilliantly came up with the special edition that the Naval Institute proceedings, uh, Naval Institute published, Naval Institute Press, uh, to get J.C. Wiley's name and, most importantly, his ideas on cumulative strategy and, uh, back into or into the mainstream of uh, strategic thought. And I think we've done that. I, I, I think it's it's there. He's he's much more known and, and acknowledged than he was in. Uh, uh, in the 80s, certainly, um, but but it's the contribution to the to the literature uh, that uh, was the most. And, and then, I guess, I, I guess the email that I got today from Steve Wills. Uh, so Steve sends me an email which he got from Tom Negus, who's down in uh, uh, Naval Warfare Development Command, and. Tom Negus is a uh, is is an officer, or former officer. Now he's a, a, a civilian working there, and he's been charged with coming up with something that became uh, published just recently: NDP One, Naval Doctrine Publication One, Naval Warfare. And uh, now he's coming up with something, uh, and I'm, I may not get the numbers right: NWP Three, uh, with Naval Operate Fleet Operations. Uh, Two 
operational level documents, not strategic level documents, to guide the U.S. Navy. And he thanked me for the contribution that I had made to those two documents. And naval operations is what the U.S. Navy is all about. It's not about documents. Nobody joins the, doc the Navy and stays in it in order to write documents, except arguably me. Uh, but, uh, but, but it's an intensely operational organization. Uh, that fact and supporting those operators is one of the things that drove me. Uh, and uh, to su continue to support operators and to continue to make a contribution that filters down to the operational uh, and even the, uh, the, uh, even the tactical level, uh, and therefore my friendship with uh, Jeff Klein and his mentor, um, Wayne Hughes, uh, that, that I think is, is the most important thing, the ability to tie operations to strategy and to influence operators and to support operators as a strategist. Well, thank okay. you very much, Peter, and again, congratulations. Yes, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, we have a, a second question from Sal Mercogliano. Uh, Sal, uh, I wanted to give you a second to unmute your microphone and pose your question to Peter. Uh, what would uh, advice of, of, to upcoming naval strategists, perhaps? Sal? Well, no, I, I appreciate it, Randy, and congrats to Peter. I, I just wanted to ask him what advice he would have for up and comers in the field, and if there's any area in naval strategy that he thinks needs further research based on his experience. Uh, the advice. Uh, and it's interesting that the question comes from Sal. So for those of you, I, almost everybody here knows Sal. If you don't know Sal, he is the premier expert on sea lift, uh, merchant marine. He's a merchant mariner himself, as well as a distinguished academic. Uh, and uh, the answer is make sure that you rope in the Sal's of the world and the subject. The Navy is a huge conglomerate. And how all the pieces fit is very, very difficult to understand. I dare say even some CNOs have not understood it. And it's hard, um, but it's there. And we spend, as taxpayers, billions of dollars on this stuff. And trying to make it all fit and figuring out how it all fits and then where to go with that fit, what to abandon, what to plus up, and so on. Um, you've got to cast a very wide net as a Navy strategist because the uses of naval power are so well, so powerful and so important, um, but they're also so varied. Uh, when I was doing my history of Navy deployment strategy, I was struck by this. I mean, scientific expeditions and riverine warfare and humanitarian disaster relief and um, hitching up two naval warships and shipping them over to, what was it, Tacoma, Washington in the, internal, in the interwar period so that they could power a city that had lost electricity and was off the grid. And we used two warships to put it back on the grid. I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on, the different kinds of things that Navy, that our Navy, let alone other people's Navy, have done and can do and would do. Uh, and trying to get your arms around the whole thing, which sounds very, very daunting, but is really necessary in the case of the Navy, uh, because at the end of the day, some congressman up there, uh, you're asking him to fund something, and he wants to know the context. Now, he's got part of the context, right? The, the, the widget should be built in his district. Okay, that's part of it. Um, but the other part of it is, well, why do you need this thing? Well, I need this thing because we had one, and it's not as good as this one, and so on. Not good enough. How does it fit into the larger context? Uh, and those are the kinds of questions I think that Navy strategists have got to ask themselves. When I'm asked periodically to chop on a Navy uh, document, usually the kinds of things I come up with are, well, you forgot about this, or you didn't emphasize that enough, or what about this other thing? Here's, here's a whole new sea lift budget that's being touted by the Secretary of Defense, and have you, in fact, taken this into account uh, in your zeal uh, to deal with issues regarding carriers, LCS, uh, and unmanned, uh, un un unmanned uh, uh, cruise missiles, for example. Um, anyway, that I, th I think would be my answer. Okay, next is from Professor Joel Sokolsky in Canada. 
Yeah. Uh, hello, Peter. Congratulations. Hi, Joe. How are you? Yeah, I just wanted to know uh, what you thought or uh, the impacts of 9-11 and the campaigns in Iraq and Afghanistan have been on naval thinking and the role of sea power in the 20th century. Thank you. <laughs> it's damn near destroyed it, uh, but we're coming back and that's what this book is about and that's what uh, the efforts that OPNAV and uh, Tom Nagus down in, uh, down in uh, Norfolk has uh, in, in trying to, uh, and what Jeff is doing out in Monterey and others, they're trying to, trying to bring it back. And, and I think the arguments on, on strategy uh, that are now uh, part of uh, the budget arguments uh, are, uh, are salutary. Um, what would be the role of blockade? What would be the role of strike warfare uh, in the future, uh, given a certain set of threats and everything, are becoming uh, salient again in a way that they weren't. But we really did lose an awful lot uh, because when budgets were, were tight and falling and had to be cut, um, you kept the thing that you were doing right now, which was sending aircraft over Middle Eastern countries to uh, support guys on the ground. Uh, and. Uh, and you had to fund that. And pretty soon that was all you were funding. And in response to your question, that's all you were thinking about. And now, but we've got this literature that we've created, uh, the maritime strategy work, stuff I've done, certainly John Lehman's book on, uh, uh, on, on Oceans Ventured. Um, we've done uh, a, a good job uh, at creating, uh, John Hattendorf's publication of the, uh, the Wiley book, of, of, of resurrecting and uh, repackaging uh, the strategic thinking of before to act as a foundation and to act as the proverbial shoulders that people here have talked about. Um, you know, Joe, I'm, I'm really glad that you uh, intervened because I think you're, uh, you're another example of a theme that I didn't talk about uh, in terms of what motivated me. You know, the Navy's a very competitive place. Uh, the Office of course, certainly is. And the feeling of competition uh, with other like-minded, uh, good, brilliant, but nevertheless competing people um, is, uh, is rife in the office of Corps, and it's something that I enjoyed uh, and took advantage of. Uh, and some of it started with my relationship with Joel. So Joel is up at Harvard working under Huntington, uh, and he's writing about the Navy and NATO. And Peter is down at Columbia working under Warner Schilling, um, and he's writing about the Navy and NATO. And Warner Schilling, who was a fantastic mentor to me and a, a, great, a, a great inspiration and a great academic, a great professor, he's no longer with us, unfortunately, um, said, hey, we, we really ought to do something about this guy up at Harvard that's doing this thing. And uh, Bob Jervis, another brilliant, fantastic mentor of mine said, you know, there's enough room in the world for a hundred books on the Navy and NATO. Um, there isn't, this isn't competition. Uh, this is collaboration. What Peter's now got is a colleague that he can talk to, uh, probably the only other guy on the planet that understands what he's wrestling with. And uh, what I was wrestling with didn't turn into a dissertation. It turned into some articles and more importantly, probably, it turned into the background that I had to work on the maritime strategy and subsequent stuff. And Joel came out with his great dissertation and even greater book on the Navy and NATO. Uh, and the idea that you can have these competitions with really, really sharp people um, and also collaborate with them and, 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 uh, and, and cooperate with them stuck with me from the experience that I had in dealing with Schilling, with Jervis, and with Joel, who's been a lifelong, uh, a lifelong friend. And that carried over into the Navy. I don't know if they're on board right now in this, but uh, I had that sense of, uh, I, I couldn't keep up with the competition that was in the Navy. Uh, Jim Stark, Filder, Hank Maws, uh, people that I was thrown uh, in, 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 in bed with, uh, but we became good friends. They were mentors of mine. Uh, they're good friends today uh, and together, the synergy of that combination of competition and and uh, and uh, collaboration um, is what has created some of the uh, the finest thinking I think 
that I've seen in the Navy and other places. And you can also see it reflected uh, in Germany and in Poland uh, in the essays by Sebastian uh, and Andre on, uh, on how to uh, create strategy in their countries. Paul Jara, you're up next. Thank you, Randy. Um, Peter, uh, it's, it's great to see you and great to hear you and you, you bring back so many memories. Um, I want to ask you a question about something that's been uh, a burr under my saddle for a long time. What is your sense of why and how the bottom fell out of Navy and in particular OPNAV strategic planning as the Cold War ended? Um, it was uh, had multiple reasons, but chief among them certainly was Goldwater Nichols. Uh, and uh, Steve, uh, Steve has written about this in, uh, in uh, his War College Review article, Steve Wills, uh, and he's got a book coming out on it uh, next year. And you can, if you need something immediately that's thick, he's got a dissertation on it. Um, what the Navy had in the 1980s when I was working on strategy, was this colossal cut, and I've just touched on it in talking, talking to Joe, had this colossal cadre of political, military, strategic planning subspecialists who were on their first, second, third, fourth, or fifth tour in OP 06 as strategists and policy uh, staff officers. And these people had had war college, or Fletcher or other graduate ex educational experience that was top notch. Remember the War College, it would have been Stan Turner's Strategic Revolution War College uh, at, uh, at Newport. Um, and the cadre, the extraordinary nature of this cadre, and I mentioned a couple of the people, Phil and, and, uh, and, and Jim, but I mean, there were, there were many of us, there were dozens of us, and we were on different sides of the fence and on arguments. Um, uh, there was uh, there was Harlan. Uh, there were there were a number of us in the strategy business with experience. Harlan, who had a PhD from from uh, Fletcher and uh, uh, had had uh, also taught at National War College. Um, Ace Lyons. Ace Lyons is 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 uh, my my example of this. Uh, so everybody knows Ace, right? He's unfortunately passed away. Uh, he was this hard-charging, seagoing truck driver, uh, swore a lot. Uh, he was like the Robert Newton figure in uh, Long John Silver in uh, the movie Treasure Island. That's not the ace that I dealt with. The ace I dealt with had had a year at the National War College. He'd had a year at the Naval War College. He'd had my job as an action officer in Op 06. He'd then gone on and been a Navy planner He'd gone on and made flag and been the deputy in Op 60. And when he finally became the three star in Op 06, he'd had five tours in Op 06 as a Navy strategy and planner. The guy he relieved who went down below to the joint staff to be the assistant to the chairman was Vice Admiral Art Moreau, who had had a similar set of uh, wickets that he'd gone through as a Navy strategist. My mentor and guide a couple of levels down, Bob Hilton was, was the same. And the people I worked with had those kinds of experiences. Uh, Jim, who spoke German and, and uh, had been, uh, had, a, had a tour in Germany. Ray Conrad, who was our NATO expert, who'd had a tour at the German Naval War College. Dave Chandler with his tour at the Naval War College. There were literally dozens, uh, maybe, maybe it was hundreds, of people who had this experience in the 70s and in the 80s, who for, and in the 60s probably, who then formed this critical mass. And Paul, you came in at the tail, it, it, it sort of toward, toward the end of this. Uh, again, your experience, your education, uh, and your interest. So they had interest, they had experience, they had education, and they had three stars who were sitting in the OP 06 chair who wanted to know why they were getting orders to N4 why they were getting orders to ADAC, why they were getting orders uh, to go down to the Joint Staff when he wanted and needed them in OP 06. And he would have one of his captains, or if that didn't work, he himself would call over to the Chief of Naval Personnel and say, why are you doing this? I need that guy in this chair. The result was a colossal 
number of, of officers who were adequately and appropriately trained and adequately and appropriately experienced who worked on strategy and policy uh, and, and high level operational problem. This was supplemented by the SSG experience, uh, certainly, and complemented by it in the 80s. And it all went away. The Navy still sends people to school. That's how they keep people in. And that's all that means to detailers. Check the box, he went to school. Hey, he went to Naval Postgraduate School. He did OR with, uh, with uh, Jeff Klein, uh, or he did National Security Affairs with Jim Wirtz. Um, same, same, check the box. Or maybe he went to Fletcher, fine. Uh, now we gotta broaden him and send him to M4. He certainly have to give him three years down on the joint staff in order to have the joint ticket. And a combination of effects uh, and there were other things that happened too. Uh, the changeover of the SSG, the demise of the Soviet Union, the collapse of the maritime strategy, and the need to replace it. Uh, the uh, the uh, global war games uh, demise, and then finally it was resurrected. Many of the strands that counted on this cadre, uh, and the cadre gave other people in the Navy who didn't have some of those experiences, a community for them to deal with and to uh, and to um, be part of, even if they hadn't had some of that, um, that all went away. And when the Navy then as then had, because the maritime strategy was this precedent, a CNO would say, "Well, where's my maritime strategy?" He'd go down to Op 60 later in 51 and 50, and there'd be somebody there. There'd be. Joe Bouchard or, 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 or Sam Tangredi or later on, uh, and, and now Matt Culp, uh, Bruce Stubbs, there'd be people down there, but there weren't 20 people down there. Uh, and the whole chain of command between Oppo 6 and everybody down there wasn't um, littered with people who were graduates of this kind of experience. And the N3 and N5s themselves were pr principally threes and were chosen for their acute sense of being able to be the Navy's top three, not for being the Navy's top five. Uh, so that's my answer. And uh, there's the passion in Peter behind that answer. Uh, and so, so what do we do? We at CNA and others picked ourselves up, dusted ourselves off and said, we'll help everybody. Doesn't I, I? I'm not only I'm not only going to talk to a PhD from Fletcher. If some guy has just been thrown into the barrel and told he's got to come up with a document, um, if he's interested, here's a pub he can read. If he's interested, I'll mark up his document. It wasn't just me; it was others at CNA as well. Certainly, Steve, Nalanti, Eric are carrying that all on. Does that uh, do it? I'd say so. Uh, Jeremy Stowe's next, and then uh, Jim Bergeron. Yeah, thank you very much. Looking at the time, I'll keep it uh, uh, short. Uh, Peter, congrats again. Um, my question would be, in the current strategic environment, what topics need research from a European perspective? And we've talked about this. Both. What, so could you give me two or three puzzle pieces that are still missing or major p uh, areas of research, both historically and current, and I think just as an aside, those articles from An Anjay and Sebastian are, might be those kinds of puzzle pieces in, for Americans to understand, uh, and the US Navy to understand where European navies, uh, uh, how they work, how they think, uh, and so on and so forth, the maritime strate strategic thought. Thank you very much. Um. I guess the first thing that comes to mind, given the time, maybe the only thing that we'll talk about, navies are terrific offensive institutions, terrific aggressive institutions. They are in general, and there's lots of exceptions to this, but in general, best used as a, a nation's offensive tool, both for de deterrence uh, and for actual war fighting. Uh, they're not best used as coastal defense forces. That's what you got ports and for, uh, and, and missiles. Uh, I think we, uh, many Europeans understood this clearly uh, throughout European history. Uh, a lot of that has been lost. And some Europeans never understood it because they didn't have the opportunity. Um, we, we've, we've already sort of uh, bumbled over 
uh, whether Poland is a landlocked or not a landlocked country. Poland for many years was a landlocked country and then it wasn't a country at all. Today, Poland is a not a landlocked country. It has a, 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 an important seacoast. It's in a viable strategic place. And in my view, uh, what Poland should be thinking of is what kind of a Navy do you have that will act as a deterrent against the Soviet, the Russians rather, um, uh, including in offensive operations. Now, they might be mine warfare offensive operations, they might be blockade operations, they might be aggressive uh, strike operations, I, it, it could be anti-submarine warfare operations. Um, but if you're a Pole or a German, and during the Cold War, we had this with the Germans. Um, I remember, uh, and Sebastian knows the story, uh, when I had concluded some stuff that I was doing on the maritime strategy, which was an aggressive defensive strategy of both deterrence and war fighting, uh, I came across an article or a letter in the Naval Institute proceedings by a, uh, a German, uh, Commander Troika, who was talking about uh, how the German Navy would be used uh, in a war with the Soviets. And it was offensive and it was aggressive. And the reason why they had land-based maritime airplanes uh, was to fly up as far out over the Baltic to the Soviet coasts, which were considerable in those days, uh, as possible. And the reason why they had those uh, fast patrol boats was again, to be able to surge out into the Baltic. And the reason why they had submarines was because they planned on being in the harbors uh, of St. Petersburg, uh, Kernig and, uh, and Kaliningrad, uh, and the other Soviet and Latvian, Estonian, Lithuanian ports, um, so that the Soviet invasion of the uh, Baltic coast uh, of NATO uh, would never even get the clear out of the harbor was their goal. And I said, that's, that's us, except that's them in their place. Uh, I then went down and said, well, that's interesting. I found some, I think we've got some Turkish um, um, attendees here. I said, wonder what the Turks think. And as I stopped, started to uh, tap into what Turks thought, it was the same. Turkish officers looked at me and said, why do you think we have all these submarines? Of course, if there's any Greeks here, they'll raise their hand. Well, the reason why we have all these submarines is because you're a Canadian, maybe you're a Greek. Um, and uh, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, we have these submarines because that's the only thing that's gonna be able to survive in the Black Sea when we go forward toward the Crimea and toward the other Soviet bases so that they never even get near the Straits. Oh, that sounds like the maritime strategy, except for your particular circumstances in your particular case. Um, so using that inherent uh, power of the Navy, given the fact that it's now 2021, uh, 2020, and that we now have a new generation of electronics, missiles, capabilities all around the world, I get that. Um, but trying to see how you would use the nation's naval power, whether that nation is Estonia or that nation is the United States, um, in a forward, aggressive, offensive manner in order to deter the enemy, uh, and if needs be, uh, to, to destroy him near his ports. Um, that would be uh, that my counsel for uh, for naval strategists today in Europe to take a look at. Randy, I've lost your. I was muted. Oh. I muted myself. Uh, Jim Bergeron, you're up next, and then Andrea Rezende. I hope I said your name correctly. Hello, Peter. Hey, Jim. It's great to see you. And thank you, of course, for you know, all the help over so many years in my time at Marcom, Strikeforce NATO, and, and Navier. Um, you were really the only person who really had studied the history of Navier. So when I got there and I needed to understand it better, you, know, you became that amazing resource. Um, it was much appreciated. My, my question was, I think you might have partly answered it already, but I'll, I'll throw it out anyway, which is, because it, it, it leads a lot to the debates we're having right now in NATO. Um, what do you think? This is one of these, this window, this is like your first question of you know, what's the one thing, right? But what is, if you had to pick one, what is the greatest strategic blind spot or error of assumption that we are making as regards the application of naval power in deterrence and particularly 
and I know it's different, but for both Russia and China. And you can answer that th thinking about the U.S. Navy, or secondarily NATO, or both. Um, the thing that comes to mind, and I'm not sure it is the most important, but it is the most important thing on my mind recently, uh, has been the whole subject of uh, using the Navy uh, as part of national and alliance policies uh, to squeeze the enemy economically. Um, that's at the broad policy level, bringing it down to something that's at the, uh, at the uh, deck plates level. Uh, we're not looking enough at blockade. We're not looking enough at blockade uh, on the Asian side. We're not looking enough at blockade in the Atlantic side. I think Peter just froze. Hold on. I uh, went out of order while well, we've got a moment for administrative details. I, uh, Ms. Resende, I'm going to ask you to come after Steve Wills, who will come next. I got the order wrong. Following the chat is a new thing for me, so I apologize for rushing you in. But uh, we'll make sure that you get your question in, since I promised you the chance to do so. So we want to make sure of this. I should note, we've got a couple of questions on the chat about whether or not the uh, video will be available online. It will be at the ISPK website. If you check the chat and scroll up and down in it, you'll also see where you can find copies of the book. Uh, uh, the uh, apologies uh, for, the, for the price of it, but uh, we're a victim of our own success because we have so many essays in the book. It grew and it was bigger than we anticipated. So as a consequence, uh, uh, it, it, is, it is pricey, but perhaps you can convince a local library or a work library to purchase a copy of it. Um, and in that regard, um, I also noticed uh, some other discussions. Uh, several people have stepped off and um, Ah, Sebastian has given me the address for the YouTube page uh, of is at www.keelcpowerseries, that's all one word, dot com. Uh, and I just want to make sure about that. Um, notice that uh, we've got some comments from uh, John Kuhn about Turkey. Um, uh, to, again, I invite people to comment and discuss things in the chat session while we're waiting for Peter to return. It's unfortunate that uh, we lose our star at this exact moment, but... Uh, at least this way, uh, it's the way it goes, I'm afraid. Do any of the contributors wish to say anything at this stage? Perhaps uh, just to put in a word edgewise. Uh, I know that there are about, as I said, about nine of us on. Um, if anyone wishes to weigh in, please feel free to do so just by unmuting your microphone and identify who you are, please. I, uh, I'm trying to fight dead air, as they say in the television business. So. I have to say, I had a question all lined up about how to bridge academia and serving officers, but Peter, of course, got to that in one of his answers, uh, and I'm glad that he did, so I didn't need to ask that. Well, if you bear with us for a moment, we'll just uh, get Peter back and make sure that it happens. Thanks. I've just spoken with uh, Peter's son, Daniel. Uh, the computer froze. They're rebooting, so it's going to take a moment. Uh, bear with us, please. I apologize for the delay, uh, but uh, I'm very glad to see so many of you today. We, we're very impressed. By the very number, by the very large number of people who joined us, um, and this is one of the largest Zoom calls I've ever hosted. So I'm very happy to have as many of you as there are on the call today. We'll get back to them as soon as we can. Thanks. Hey, Randy, this is Steve Wills. Maybe I'll just tee up my question here in advance, and then Peter can uh, can expound upon it in detail because his work, of course, in inspired it. So you heard Jeff Klein earlier describe himself as one of the sort of card carrying analyst. Uh, sides. Um, Peter, obviously a representation of the strategist side. My question to Peter is going to be, how do we get these two groups to actually move forward together in sort of a coherent way? They really have been sort of on and off competitors for a long time. And even from where I, I currently sit, I, I don't see a lot of rapprochement going on uh, where it probably needs to, especially now. You still have a lot of people out there saying, you know, show me your budget and I'll tell you your strategy. And we've got to move away from that and move to some sort of middle ground. So I'd be curious to know if anybody's got ideas about, and I'm sure Peter will tell us that too, about how we do that. Thank you. I welcome the interventions of anyone in the audience who wishes to say something briefly while we're waiting for Peter to resume. You're welcome to join in and comment on, on Steve's question, which is a good one. I know that I've been told, you know, when I sat in a, in a strategy cell once uh, in the, for the Navy, I said, well, you live in a resource unconstrained world and your strategies are all well and good. Um, and really, um, ideas are limited by reality, for crying out loud. Randy, this is Paul Gerard. I have a comment on what Steve said, which brings together 
uh, what Steve does and what Jeff Klein does. Um, I think uh, we're at a point now where new modeling simulation and digital twin technology is going to be enable us to build uh, what would essentially be a maritime environment. And you can bring, you could, uh, if that were actually instituted and facilitated, you could bring together um, Excel and Word in the same process where the Excel crowd, I shouldn't say it that, I don't mean that to sound pejorative, the, the Excel group, the analytical numerical group um, keeps uh, the word group honest because the word group, speaking for myself, tends to expostulate and talk with their hands and e exaggerate and, and get pretty fired up and, and, and passionate about things. But I think you can bring these two thing, these two groups together. And in fact, not only do I think we can, I think we have to because unless we, res we, we redress that split, that dichotomy, that, that bifurcation and divergence in our analysis, well, then the analysis isn't going to amount to a hill of beans uh, because uh, the, the numerical, the numericists are right. You can't afford that strategy, but the, the word document people are right too. We have to have a strategy no matter what the cost almost. So how do you resolve that? That uh, It's not a contradiction. It, it's something that has to come together and can, I believe can and is going to have to exist simultaneously together. Not like two scorpions in a bottle. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about two long lost siblings who, who have this great rapp rapprochement. I think that's the future. I think Jeff Klein is going to be part of that, literally and figuratively. And I think Steve Wills is going to be part of that, literally and figuratively. And I think Peter Schwartz, who's now, I think, back online, would recognize that if he saw it. Because in many ways, that was what was the brilliance of the, of the global war games while the Cold War was still on. That it forced people to think realistically, but then to confront what that reality was and to deal with it in a way that that uh, conceptually in in a community way could be accepted so that's that's what i think about what steve will said which is as usual is a, is a very useful intervention on the part of steve peter peter is indeed back with uh, back with us on on the call um uh, Steve Wills asked a question, which we had a bit of discussion in your absence, Peter. Um, I invite him to pose it to you directly, uh, just briefly, and then uh, Alec, uh, then then we'll move on to Andrea Resende, and uh, uh, we're going to try to we're going to stretch a little long. I feel like I'm on television news where I said I want to let the affiliates know that we're going to be running long today. So uh, uh, just a few minutes, though, I'm going to try to respect people's time. But Steve, if you wish to uh, intervene now, yeah, Peter, I'll go quickly. Um... We've talked about the the analyst side of of the Navy, uh, the the N eighty one crowd versus now the N seven two S strategy and policy crowd. My question was, how do we bring those two groups back together? I guess Admiral Zumwalt was pretty good at managing them, but but we still have sort of barriers, and you still have, as I said, too many people out there running around saying, "Show me your budget, and I'll tell you your strategy." How do we fix that? Thanks. Um, the way you do it is you do it. Uh, the folks that are in N3, N5 have got to go down, well, figuratively now, we've got a virus on our hands, uh, and knock on the door of N81 and vice versa. Um, we had a huge amount of crosstalk among communities during the 80s um, that built on the fact that you had this very, very robust cadre of analysts but also a very, very robust cadre of whole mill strategic planning. That was what we were called at that time, experts. Daniel, I'm missing something here. Um, uh, so uh, the, you, the, the, uh, but it helps if the folks in both places are at the top of their form and have mutual respect. One of the problems we've got is the analysts are down in the JA. The strategists have happened the J5. It's not the same people in OpNav uh, today as were, and, and we, we, we know this from the study that Herb Blickstein uh, did on programmers. 
and the difference in N80 between the op 90 that he knew and the N8 uh, later. Uh, there's uh, another study, and I can't remember what it is, but I believe there was another study about 81, or maybe it was just the anecdotal, but the anecdote came from Trip Barber or somebody who, who, was, who was very, very solid at this. Uh, and then, of course, what I just said. Uh, so OPNAV itself, uh, as a, the entire institution, um, isn't the same as it was. Well, hell, you're, you're Steve Wills. You're the guy that has is, that is written about this. OPNAV itself isn't what it once was. Um, so the way to fix it is you got to fix it. You, you, people have got to talk to each other. And go, go, go back. And, and I don't know what the uh, today with the current way of communicating. Remember, right? My, in my era, it was an armload of view graphs that weighed a ton. And one of your arms was always longer than the other uh, that you were scampering up and down Pentagon halls with. Um, but there's got to be a way of bridging and, and communicating today. And from the top, some sort of signal that strategy that, that this ought to happen and that strategy is important, uh, along with uh, the budget work. Um, and maybe I'm I'm out of it now. I've been out of it for a year and a half. So commenting on uh, on what's going on exactly right now would be un unfair. It's uh, it's actually what I turned over to you and Melanthe uh, and Josh Dallas. So um, and Eric. So uh, you guys know what it is, but it's 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 the it's this bridging and communication. Um, yes, there was um, tension, to say the least, between N81 analysis in those days, Op 96, uh, and it was embodied in the uh, in the issues when uh, uh, when Harlan in 965 and uh, Bill Lanthorpe in, uh, in that assessment. Um, had a view regarding the future of the 600 ship Navy and that it was going to be hard, if not impossible, to get there under a variety of uh, assumptions that they made. And of course, we had a Secretary of the Navy um, who thought that was unhelpful. Uh, but the crosstalk was there. And as a matter of fact, recall that my boss, when I was working in the Maritime Strategy, uh, and my mentor uh, was, was, was Roger Barnett. And what had he done two or three tours before? He'd been up 965. He'd been on that side of it, uh, as well as having uh, a, a degree in, uh, in, in political science. Um, and my colleague who was sitting next to me, a caddy corner to me, I guess it was, um, was Jim Stark. Uh, and Jim had had a tour in 965. That's where we met. And Jim, and that was a good example of, the, uh, of, of a relationship that, that had some competition in it. Um, a competition I normally lost, so, uh, um, but also some collaboration and being able to tap into um, the, uh, the different disciplines uh, and cross them. Excellent. Um, um, just for, the, for the, uh, the viewers on the call still, um, I just wanted to point out that uh, our next speak, our next question will be Ms. Rizende again. Uh, and then afterwards, I'm going to give Jim Bergeron a chance to tighten up because his um, his question was cut off by the technical problem that we had. So Jim, you'll get a chance to finish up and then we'll turn it over to Sebastian Bruns for a wind up. <clears throat> but uh, Ms. Resende, please uh, pass your question on to Peter now, but unmute first. Hi, uh, hello, are you listening to me? Yes, uh, fine. Gotcha. Oh, uh, sorry for being a little bit informed. Uh, I can't express how honored I am to be here amongst the chief. Greatest minds in your field. And I would jump to the second question because I think the first is already, has already been answered. Uh, Mr. Schwartz, uh, it's an honor to meet you. And I am Andrea. I study the US uh, basin. Actually, I have the focus on naval basin. And I think that uh, the basin subject is being left aside uh, on, the, on our field. And and I think it's, uh, it's uh, even in the face of the Chinese strategy in the Pacific with the building, with the, them building artificial islands, and even in the presence of the United, United Kingdom in the, the South Atlantic area uh, next to us in Brazil. And I would like to hear what you think about the, uh, all of this. And uh, thank you again. I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm a little bit uh, nervous and anxious to be here. Thank you. Yeah, on, on the subject of bases, um, basing like 
every other aspect of Navy uh, policy and strategy um, evolves. Uh, as technology evolves, as the international situation evolves, uh, and as uh, domestic politics in whatever country you're in evolves. Uh, and that's true of us. It's true of the former colonial powers in, in, in Europe uh, and, and Japan. Um, and basing today is, uh, is different. Um, you look at the kerfuffle we just had with the president uh, making an offer to buy Denmark, uh, buy, to buy Greenland from Denmark, um, which would have been a perfectly normal thing for a state to have done in the 19th century. Uh, and see how it worked. And as a matter of fact, we did in fact purchase a colony from, from Denmark uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, which was the Virgin Islands. Um, it's something we've done, uh, but wound up feeling very, very inappropriate to the year uh, uh, 2019, 2020. Um, so uh, basing is, uh, is important, uh, but it varies. And for today, I, the basing situation uh, will be different. There are going to be some places uh, where uh, bases are, are welcome, some that they're not, some that they're welcome provided you don't fly your flag, some that uh, would not, some in which they won't be bases, they'll be your bases, but you're allowing us to use them wherever you are, whichever country you are. Um, so uh, can you do it without bases? Sure. Um, that's one of the things we, we, we did in World War II was the origins of the Sixth Fleet, uh, which was the capability of maintaining a fleet at sea, thousands of miles away from the home country, without basing. We did that. Of course, we had the leftover 2,000 logistics ships from World War II, all during the early Cold War, that we were able to use. And we know how to build the right kind of ships, because we have a few of them, uh, but they're very, very good. And that technology of underway replenishment enables you to be free from bases, but it's expensive because you need more than one ship. You need many to be able to do the shuttle back and forth. And little by little over time, um, we in the United States uh, drew down on our base, on, on our ships that are capable of doing that uh, underway and relied more and more on bases. We got rid of the t most of the tenders which had like 5,000 sailors on them who had to be paid and promoted and, and taken care of, uh, as well as the great work that they were doing for us. And it was a lot easier to just put into a base or put into a port. That's the other thing that's happened. The changes in ports over time. You know, you needed a base in the Middle East uh, because there was nothing there. A few pearl fishing uh, villages, and that was it in the Persian Gulf. You need a base in the Middle East if you're not putting airplanes there, given the fact that you now have dry docks and huge ports up and down the, 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 the Gulf uh, from a number of states that didn't have that infrastructure before, but now they do. Um, let me tell you a story about basing, though. Two other considerations. One is relations with the host nation, and the second is security. So, and this is a personal story. So, in 1970, one, back from Vietnam, uh, Admiral Zumwalt, uh, CNO, uh, was an art, a chapter, of course, um, in the press script on this, um, decided that he needed a home port, more of the forward fleet overseas. That would save a lot of time and a lot of money. Ships didn't have to go back and forth across the ocean. They would be home ported. Their families would be there in ports, forward in Japan and forward in Greece and in Italy and in Spain. So that was the overseas home porting program. Well, um, some Spaniards and some Italians and some Greeks and some Japanese didn't think this was a great idea because they just simply didn't want all these foreigners around because they didn't like or understand Americans. And there were some Americans in the Navy who didn't think this was a great idea either because they didn't want to live with a bunch of foreigners. But we had just come out of the Vietnam War, not well, but we had come out of it, or we were in the process rather, at the time of coming out of it. Admiral Zumwalt was coming out of his experience with it. And in Vietnam, we had similar problems. You were supposed to advise Vietnamese um, who uh, didn't understand or like Americans, and the Americans had to deal with Vietnamese uh, who they disliked. 
And we ran courses and we ran uh, studies and we did a whole number of things to try to break down barriers between Vietnamese and Americans. And Admiral Zumwalt said, well, why don't you try to apply that overseas uh, in these base areas? And so an intercultural relations program was set up, very robust, with teams of experts who were wearing the uniform uh, in Greece and in Italy and in Spain and in La Maddalena, uh, Sardinia, uh, and in Japan to explain what the host country was like and what the host nation culture was like and to make them more adaptable uh, living in these um, these foreign locations. And no place was this done with more of a vengeance than La Madalena. We set up a submarine base from scratch uh, on uh, the island of uh, La Madalena off the coast of, uh, of, of Sardinia. Uh, it was a uh, tourist port. Um, the uh, villagers uh, were happy to get the money but weren't so happy to get the American culture. But on the other hand, they were an unusually um, conversant lot in culture because high society went to La Madalena to party. Uh, so they were used to that. And the idea was to set up a town, that were a, an American integrated town with the Italians. So the commissary would be over here in this part of town and the uh, exchange would be over here. The headquarters, I remember going to the headquarters, if you walked up the flight of stairs, and you rang the bell on the left, you got the landlady. And if you rang the bell on the right, you got headquarters, naval support activity, La Madalena. You open the door, there's a bunch of sailors there with typewriters. You remember what typewriters were. And um, uh, the office of the commander of the base, such as it was. Uh, if you went down to the waterfront, that's where the, the submarines came in. Uh, that had a fence around it. And uh, But none of the other services were there. They were in other parts. People lived in town, they rented apartments from Italian landlords and landladies, and we were scattered every place. And the idea was to integrate the Americans and the Italians into one community. And this intercultural relations team, which I was one of the uh, organizers of, um, was there to hold the hands of Americans and say, they're there, the reason why they did that is because it's their culture, not because they hate you, uh, and all of the other things that were going on. We just celebrated the, what, 20th anniversary of the bombing of the coal. We sent the ships routinely in those days in and out of ports. We had some rudimentary security, uh, but by and large, people knew that American Navy ships pulled in and out. It was no big deal. They took our money and we had our fun. Um, it, was, it was good and we got our fuel and our supplies and all that changed with the bombing of the coal we realized we were terribly vulnerable and our bases were vulnerable. And just going into a port that wasn't a base, but somebody else's base was vulnerable. Security became a big deal. In the age of terrorism, tour, uh, the, the security of bases um, is, is, is of extraordinary value. And you can read about that issue too in Dick Marcinko's famous book, uh, Rogue Warrior. Uh, Dick Marcinko was said, one of the things that he did uh, as a uh, as a CEO, uh, was set up a red team that crashed around American bases and showed how easy it was to break in. Um, and, uh, and you can read about that in the book. Uh, if you, you've got to hold your nose a bit. Um, he does use some fairly rough language in, in every paragraph. Um, but uh, we we were in a whole new world on security. And then they took a look at Lamar Lina and said, well, okay, how do we make Lamar Lina more secure? Well, it turned out a retired Navy captain who used to be a lieutenant who set this thing up uh, at CNA was one of the guys designated to take a look at La Madalena. So that was me. And I went out there and with security experts, and we agreed. There was nothing you could do with La Madalena. It was designed to be insecure. It was designed to be integrated. It was not designed to be a little America, which is exactly the thing that you needed, a little port. Look at what our embassies look like today. Uh, in the case of the, the terrorist thing. We closed La Madalena. Right? Um, in, 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 in part uh, because of CNA's work, but uh, mostly because of, of, of other reasons. Um, so those are two considerations in today's world, terrorism, 
whether or not the base, the base may not be designed for terrorists. It may be designed uh, for great power competition, uh, but the terrorists don't know that. They're looking for vulnerabilities anyplace, even in a place like Aden 20 years ago. Uh, and so that becomes a consideration. Um, I hope that helped answer the question. I'm not a basing expert, but that's, uh, that's what I think. Jim Bergeron, and then um, I'm, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to can't obviously hold anybody on the call, but we have one more call from uh, somebody named Kempton. Um, I will let him slip in. But first, Jim Bergeron, you were talking about you asked Peter a question about blockade, and I wanted to give you a chance to focus that question a bit more tightly so that Peter could answer it, and then we'll take one last question, and I'll turn it over to Sebastian Plintz thereafter. Thank you. Hi, hi again, Peter. I, I, I'm lucky. I'm getting a second chomp at the apple because of the interruption. Um, but I did hear enough of your of your of your of your response that you, to look at the economic impact that navies can have effectively on you know by, by economically squeezing an adversary. Um, that tied into something I wanted to push a little bit hard, a little bit deeper on, and it's been discussed already a few times, and that is this balance between the offensive and the defensive posture of naval power uh, in competition and, and, and crisis. Um, I, one, of the nicest, one of the things I most enjoyed about reading Ocean's Venture was the description of the, of the, Navy, of the attitude of this government towards the Navy in the 1970s, um, with the notion that, well, we'll stay down here and we'll, we'll, keep, you know, we'll deal with them if they come after us, but we won't go after them. Um, there's a very similar, we're in a very similar cultural moment right now. A great, a big debate in my circle around what is, what are navies for? What are they really for? And given the politics of the alliance, it's very hard to make an argument that navies deter by, by, by aggressive posturing. Um, the interesting, the art of course is to know when they properly deter and what kind of aggressive posturing doesn't bring about the very conflagration you were hoping to avoid. Um, but I wonder if I could press you a little bit more on this, on what is in a sense, a question about time. It's about whether you can have a wafer thin, thin blue line that is a sacrificial force because you know you'll come back like gangbusters in six months to a year, or whether that logic works anymore, whether you have to be forward all the time with something. Uh, I, 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 I do believe that the proper role, a proper role for naval forces uh, in uh, in peacetime is to be able to show that in wartime, they're gonna clean the other guy's clock. So you better not try it. Uh, and in some places that's useful. And it is always controversial. It was controversial in the 80s. I'm not gonna say the 80s was some sort of golden age of offensive war. They were, they were uh, brilliant uh, uh, writers uh, who, who thought the maritime strategy uh, was to use the technical term that they used, crazy. Uh, yeah. Mearsheimer and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and Barry Posen. Uh, and, and so it's always controversial. But, but we believe, based on our understanding of the other side, that we were having the right deterrent effect. Uh, and, and that's part of the equation. What kind of effect are you having on the other side and then we turned around to, their, to, to our allies at the time and said, these are the kind of effects that we're having. Um, they're paying attention. You're, you're saying that they don't care about the Navy. <laughs> Here's, they certainly do. Um, and you're saying that the Navy is not important um, because it's not uh, helping with the central problem, which you believe is somewhere in Bavaria and Hesse. Boy, that's not what the Norwegians think. And that's not what the Turks think. And that's not what the Japanese think. Um, because they're right on point, or the South Koreans, they're the ones that are right out on point. Um, I, it's, it's a complicated problem, but I believe that there's a role for beefing up, touting, practicing, and having doctrinal um, uh, concepts and doctrine uh, on how you would use your Navy uh, in, an, in, in, in an offensive manner uh, and signal that selectively. You don't want to tell them the frequency you're using or the D plus what that the ship is going to be ready, um, but signaling that 
that's, you know, if, if you act up, this is the kind of thing you're going to elicit. Uh, and I believe that there's still a role for naval forces for that. All right, then. Thank you. And Kempton, please introduce yourself, by the way, so we know who you are. Uh, hi, uh, Kevin Schwartz. Great to uh, see you after 12 years. Um, been a long time. Yeah, it's been it's been a while. Yes, I'm. Uh, my name's Kempton. I'm the second mate on the Car Ferry Badger, which is kind of like out of left field, I'll grant you. Uh, that's and I don't really know how I ended up there, other than just life. Um, but my question certainly uh, make make sure Sal Mercogliano knows how to get a hold of you, and he can study you. Right. Oh, geez. oh, I'm a specimen now. Okay. Um, yeah. So my father is a chaplain on the Western Rivers, and I work on, on the Great Lakes. And I've worked as a relief mate on, you know, Edmund Fitzgerald-like uh, vessels. And now I'm working on the Badger. And definitely in the last three years that I've been out there, there is a feeling of, you know, to quote 1970s lingo, malaise. Um, and lack of inclusion. One thing my dad has done has uh, to each of the uh, towboats that he visits in his capacity as a chaplain is to give them U.S. Merchant Marine flags uh, to help them feel. And and, and my, my late grandfather, who was uh, who was a Kings Point graduate and did convoy runs during World War II, my dad uh, used to take him around to make them feel a part of a larger cohesive, you know, the maritime the American maritime world, and the look on these folks face when they would get this U.S. Merchant Marine flag, they'd never seen this before. They never saw themselves as part of a, of the, of a larger, uh, you know, world that is, you know, that I think dominated by coastal, by, by, by coastal concepts. And my question are, is, is really, you know, what are, what are your thoughts on uh, what role the Great Lakes and the Western rivers can play um, going into the 21st century for, towards an American uh, maritime strategy? Um, the two things that come to mind, of course, to me, and I'm no expert on it, are uh, A, the pool of Navy, uh, of, of maritime savvy people embodied in the sailors and the mates and, and, and the captains and so on. And then second, the shipbuilding industry. I mean, you, you've got uh, shipbuilders there and, uh, and good ones. Uh, and you've got uh, powerful proponents in Congress uh, for their shipbuilding interests, uh, especially uh, congressmen from uh, from Wisconsin. Um, and uh, so, I mean, that's uh, it, it, partly they have uh, they have an interest in this, uh, and um, and so I I I think that. Uh, the, 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 the region itself is part of America. America itself, well, all of us are threatened by the Chinese and the Russians, uh, and to some extent by the Iranians and the North Koreans. Uh, they're as threatened as anybody else. And as missile ranges get longer and so on, uh, they'll be amazed at how threatened they'll be. Uh, and, uh, deterring, uh, any hostile action against us, uh, is something that they're, they're part of when they're building, uh, a frigate or an LCS. Uh, or, or, or something uh, for us. Um, let me just say that if Sal is still around, uh, I'd like Sal to take a, a crack at answering uh, because he's far more knowledgeable than I am. Um, so, um, but that's, uh, those are my initial thoughts. No, I echo what Peter said. I, I think that infrastructure is, is one of the biggest issues I would argue is that integration and the interoperability of the commercial sector and the military sector, which sometimes doesn't get looked at in the way it should. A lot of the reasons I would argue that our ship costs are so accelerated in the Navy is the loss of our infrastructure on the commercial side. So I would just echo exactly what Peter said. I have to wind up now, but I would like to point out that uh, there are at least uh, participants on this call from 12 countries uh, which I consider to be a tremendous compliment. Your attention has, and patience has been wonderful, especially because I'm new at this with doing Zoom calls, and I'm really grateful for the chance to do so. And now over to my colleague, Dr. Sebastian Bluntz, who for the final wrap up and uh, a few uh, administrative remarks as well. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Um, I, I will keep this short. Um, I'm, I'm very excited uh, for these past two hours. I'm also a bit sad because uh, I, I know now what been missing in my life, certainly my, in my professional life, and probably you feel the uh, same way, uh, a similar way uh, for the past uh, eight or nine months, um, 
but this is the second best uh, the second best option right after uh, meeting in, in, in person. And um, I think one of my major takeaways here is uh, uh, we could easily run this uh, for another hour or two um, because it's just so so fascinating. Um, and I, I hope we can continue this conversation uh, at least virtually one way or another, um, but also very soon in, uh, in person again. Uh, for one thing, the Kiel International Sea Power Symposium, um, I've also mentioned it in the, in the chat function, uh, it's, it's uh, hosted by ISPK um, and uh, it's become a forum, um, a venue for naval strategists uh, to meet and discuss. So everyone from this group, um, and we hope that by 22 June of 2021, so next, next June, next summer, on the occasion of, of Kiel Week, as always, um, uh, we will be able to exchange ideas and, and uh, our different views and perspectives um, in person, if possible. Uh, we are currently planning it as a live event, um, as in the old days, uh, I dare say, but we are prepared also for a hybrid version uh, where we'll have the speakers, hopefully with us, uh, and, and an online version, um, um, much like this, um, to participate. Uh, if you're interested in joining the, uh, the, that conversation, um, uh, please uh, just feel free to send me an email um, or uh, just send a message to Johannes, um, who's my uh, my colleague and the, the the key account manager for that uh, for, for the Sea Power Symposium. Um, in addition, um, I want to mention the the biannual my, uh, McMullen Naval History Symposium at the United States Naval Academy, um, which is also given this community of scholars, historians, political scientists, policymakers like um, a wonderful forum for conversation. And I hope that we will be able to meet there in the fall of 2021 next year or soon thereafter, hopefully. Um, I wanna thank everyone once again for participating in this call, especially those who made uh, the technical arrangements um, uh, behind the scenes. Um, and uh, I wanna thank the speakers. Uh, I wanna thank everyone who posed a question. And um, last but not least, on behalf of the speakers and the organizers, uh, may you continue to stay in good physical and mental health in these testing times. Uh, don't forget to get check uh, www.kielcpowerseries.com. Follow us on Twitter, as is the style in the 2020s now, um, and um, to see the recording very soon on our website. Um, auf Wiedersehen. Thank you. Au revoir. Goodbye.